Thank you very much, Shagufta, uh, for uh, inviting us for this panel. Our panel is Path to Sustainable Energy Futures in Developing Countries. Uh, just in the morning, uh, uh, Dr. Zaidi started by saying that uh, we can, uh, cannot even learn from any other cases, even our, our own past, because things are so much changing. Uh, but when I see any development issue, I think there are three ways to look at these. Either a problem is my, in terms of mean, if I am a country, this is my problem, or this is somebody else's problem, or there are problems which are our problems. And energy is one of those problems which connect us through many ways, uh, particularly uh, with, with reference to this carbon emissions and uh, uh, the global environmental change that we face. So uh, with this, I think, I mean, there is still something that we can learn from each other and I mean, different cases and uh, maybe from our past to not repeat those mistakes. So far, discussing this uh, exciting panel on paths to sustainable energy, today we have a player of having with us Sir Jane Lovich, uh, who is a case law uh, professor at U uh, European University Frankfurt, and he is also uh, the director of Case Law Institute Europe. Uh, and uh, beside him, we have uh, uh, Afia Malik. Afia Malik is uh, related to energy governance uh, in, in Pakistan, and uh, energy economics is one of his uh, forte. Uh, we also have Mr. Mudassar Zuberi, who is representing uh, K Electric, often sometime in hot debate, sometime uh, uh, a kind of relationship. Uh, I mean, <laughs> always in. So, uh, and finally, we have Satendra Nath Mishra. Satendra Nath Mishra is very much uh, into uh, uh, rural energy uh, systems in India. Professor Mishra is currently engaged in a, a, a global uh, a overview of biofuels as a sustainable energy so, uh, resource. So with this, I welcome all of you uh, on the uh, stage. And I think, I mean, I have a slide. Uh, when we talk about sustainable energy uh, uh, futures, we are essentially talking about uh, energy systems of the future. And when we talk about uh, any, any energy system, Essentially, we are talking about uh, three things. The, the first, mean, from the right, so, uh, I mean, uh, the, the framework will come, but uh, at the right side of the framework, uh, we have uh, the system dynamics of energy system, that is particularly the, uh, the physical aspects of uh, uh, architecture and designs of uh, any renewable uh, systems. Today, uh, nowadays, we are too much concerned about uh, uh, renewable energy clusters, but this applies to any, any of the uh, energy system that we, we can talk about. And on the left side, we have a governance structure. Uh, without mean, uh, that, uh, uh, nothing can re really operate uh, in a in a in a manner that we can we can think of, and these two determine what kind of transactions that take place when we talk about any any energy system. So these can be contextual agreements and business models. So with this mean uh, framework uh, as as the base uh, that we'll be using uh, for discussion, I think uh, my first question uh, from our panelists will be to. Think about, uh, I mean, uh, take us uh, to their vantage point, how, see, uh, how they see, uh, uh, what is their perspective on uh, sustainable energy uh, futures. I mean, of course, we, we now may have some uh, problems. We see uh, energy system from various perspectives, like I mean, we want, all want energy systems that are accessible, affordable, clean, uh, and so many things which we, we share. But when we see from that particular vantage point, we have to be, uh, have an, some other uh, uh, aspect also. So I will invite first Mr. Mudassar Zuberi to give us perspective of uh, mean how we should mean think about these questions when we we are at the uh, we, our shoe mean we are in the shoe of a utility company or a power generator or those who are much related to physical uh, or mean. Uh, 
structural uh, issues of the energy, sorry, infrastructure, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Junaid Saab. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me amongst these esteemed guests and uh, this panel. Um, so I think all of us are cognizant of the fact and are very much acknowledge the fact that uh, you know, the time for action on climate uh, and sustainability is now. Uh, I think uh, the pondering stage is over. This is a decades-old conversation which goes back to, uh, you know, the Montreal Protocol in 1987. And since then, I think it's just been a reactive approach rather than a proactive approach. But now I think uh, we have passed uh, the point where we sh need to just kind of uh, wait and see. Um, we understand that, you know, pre-industrial levels of, uh, you know, uh, GHGs and emissions have been breached and now it's a boiling point as per the UN. Uh, so we all are cognizant of that fact. Um, we are also cognizant of the fact that despite all these stats and statistics we have regarding uh, climate change and the need for sustainability, if we zoom into Pakistan, we are actually one of the least contributors to it. So how do we tackle ourselves and uh, you know, uh, make the right, uh, you know, actions in a world where there's need for sustainable action, but you are also a developing country where sustainability means, uh, sl the meaning of sustainability is slightly different. So, you know, the context of this panel is sustainable uh, future in developing countries. Now, the dynamics of developing countries are very different from the developed and rich ones. We need affordability, we need energy security, and we need sustainability as well. Uh, sustainability can, is not just green energy and renewable energy, it means sustainability, sustainable health, sustainable lives, and massive reduction in wastage. Um, so now, if I talk from my uh, utility perspective, uh, you know, running uh, Karachi's utility, um, you know, it's a big challenge to achieve that sustainability. Um, 40 to 50 percent of our uh, city undocumented. It's kachi abadis, as we say. Um, you know, so when we talk about, you know, at a micro level that, you know, sustainability begins at home, um, it's very difficult to achieve that demand side management in uh, a city like Karachi, uh, where there's huge amounts of wastage and uh, it's very difficult to have. So what we as a utility do is we try to, you know, being a barometer of Karachi and being, you know, on the, on the pulse of Karachi, being the only sole distributor of power in Karachi, we try to, um, you know, um, uh, have those interactions and engagements with the community and be conscious of our role and responsibility in our, to our environment, our customers and, you know, the, the, the area we work with. So in light of that, you know, we have a pretty concentrated and focused approach towards our sustainability goals. We are addressing 11 out of the 17 UN SDGs. We are part of GRIs. We have recently um, uh, published our uh, ESG report. Uh, it's available on our website. It's a comprehensive report which includes all the, how should you say, um, initiatives we're taking. So, you know, all the way from inclusion and gender uh, diversity, gender diversity, you know, uh, all the way to, you know, having e-bills uh, and paperless billing, uh, which has tremendously reduced wastage um, in terms of, you know, saving of trees and, and, and waste. Um, and on a macro level, we are looking to enact, you know, a renewable energy uh, uh, in a big way. Um, but again, you know, going to, uh, back to one of my points, which I mentioned, sustainability in Pakistan is, uh, and renewable integration in Pakistan is highly linked to your infrastructure and the financing. So even under the NDC, the goals that Pakistan has signed on to, you know, 50% reduction in GHGs, uh, uh, you know, et cetera, and 30% induction of EVs, 60% induction of uh, uh, renewable energy, all of that is linked to, 35% uh, of those goals are linked to foreign financing. So that access to finance is a big challenge. Infrastructure in Pakistan, you know, for integration of renewable energy is a big challenge. We have about 2,000 megawatts of wind which is currently being curtailed because of infrastructure issues. So just an example. So for countries like Pakistan, for KE, it, it is to come up with the right balance and strike that balance between integration of sustainable energy solutions while maintaining affordability and also ensuring sustainability beyond green energy, which is stable supply and quality of electricity that can be provided to our customers. So again, you know, to summarize, uh, we are very much cognizant of our responsibility towards sustainability, but it is very important that in developing countries like Pakistan, it has to be looked holistically and not in isolation that put up solar, put up wind, 
it has to be a fine balance of the things that I tried to explain. Thank you. I should uh, now uh, invite uh, Afia that give us a macro perspective on this issue. I mean, how we look at the issue from a country perspective, a governance perspective, or wider perspective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Janet. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, let me say that what I see sustainable energy is adding to what um, just Mudassar said, assist, uh, affordable, reliable uh, access for all. And I will add and also a financially viable sector for the country. So um, what we see uh, in general for the developing countries, the demand for energy is increasing. And uh, with this increase, and uh, most of the developing countries, they are at the macro level, they are scarce in traditional fossil fuels. And they are dependent on imports for the energy. For some of the countries, they were already scarce, but for some, the uh, traditional fossil fuels are declining. So they are increasingly relying on imports. And it has directly impact their financial viability of the sector. Now, what uh, when talking about sustainability, from the perspective of a developing country at the macro level, what we have to look at what are the challenges the developing countries they are facing. The first major obstacle for the developing countries is the financial resources. They have limited financial resources. And the second uh, fundamental obstacle is since they are now relying more on the imports, it is the volatility in the global fuel market which is directly affecting the sustainability of developing countries in the uh, energy sector. And third, which uh, we are discussing uh, since morning, is about the environmental risks associated with the use of fossil fuels. And the uh, fourth uh, major challenge for the developing countries is because of the increasing reliance on imports, the affordability is directly affected and the energy tariff is going up uh, where energy tariff has gone up very uh, very high and it has now become electricity not only electricity but the overall energy has become unaffordable for everyone not only Elec uh, energy has become unaffordable uh, for everyone so uh, and because of the in, uh, 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 high, uh, high uh, um, volatility in the uh, import market, especially um, volatility in the oil and gas market, the developing countries are now relying more on the coal resources. India was already uh, very much into the coal market. Yes, also. Now Pakistan is also uh, increasingly moving towards coal. And this is adding uh, more um, increasing risk to, for the environment. Um, now, in another factor which is increasingly affecting the environment is the uh, big proportion of the population which is not uh, connected to the grid. And also a much larger proportion of the population which are not supplied with the uh, clean form of energy. So they are basically relying on uh, non-commercial energy sources and all these factors are also adding uh, to the environmental risks. And it is a challenge for the developing countries how to cater to the needs of these countries. Obviously, energy efficiency is a way to go and also renewables are getting cheaper globally and with the advancement of technology, they are getting cheaper, solar, uh, solar and wind, they are getting cheaper. And uh, renewables is also a way, good, way to go. But the path towards a sustainable energy is not an easy path for some of the developing countries like Pakistan because of their internal issues. Thank you, Afia. Thank you, Afia. This, uh, I uh, invite Professor Satendra Nath Mishra to give us, since he's a rural uh, development guy, so uh, he can give us some uh, uh, local level perspective on 
when we talk about uh, uh, sustainable energy futures for uh, our countries and societies. S Professor Satendra, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Junet. I hope I am audible to all of you there. If somebody can confirm that. If, if you can talk a little louder, yeah. we, we, we can yeah. hear you. Uh, am I, yeah, am I audible on that? Yeah, okay, thank you. I got the message. So, uh, first of all, my thanks to Professor Junaid for actually giving this opportunity and also to Institute of Business Administration for providing this platform. And uh, I'm actually thankful to be sitting with, uh, at least online with all these team panel here. And uh, good to see Professor Jens there. I will, I will be missing that platform to be there. So, uh, in the uh, start, Professor Junaid actually talks about uh, and the whole topic of this conference was challenging linearity and in that context he has talked about sustainable energy futures for developing countries. So uh, let me give an opening remark in terms of renewable energy and broadly what is happening all across the world and in that context how it is actually a challenge for linearity which actually comes from interna international institu institution in terms of policy prescriptions, financial aid. Okay. So, for example, the study that I, I have done for biofuel. So, when we are talking about biofuel, specifically biodiesel and bioethanol. So, you will find that, for example, uh, in the context of US and EU, you will find that it is actually predominantly linked with agricultural land. So, for example, in Brazil, it is sugarcane cultivation, which is linked with bioethanol. US, it is corn, agriculture crop linked with the bioethanol. And then again, in European context, in the background of common agricultural policy which came in late 19, I think, 90s. Uh, again, it is linked with the agricultural activity. So, predominantly it is agricultural activity linked with the bioethanol and then policy support for it is going into the automobile field, which is again controlled by big oil marketing companies. Now, if you come to the African context, Asian context, you will find a very contrast. The policies predominantly at the national level talks about livelihood promotions. Okay, wasteland development. So it is not linked with the agricultural activity. So one of the prime difference that comes agricultural land versus wasteland. Okay, but predominantly because policy designs are dictated by international agencies, financing aid. So you'll find that there is a contrast that happens. How to balance out uh, livelihood options at the local level, and then the interest of big oil marketing company, which actually have a control in terms of distribution of these. Uh, bioethanol or biodiesel. So, for example, in the context of, let's say, in Indian context, Asian context, Africa, it is wasteland cultivation where, let's say, Jetropa cultivation takes place. Specifically, let's say, for example, in East Asian context, for example, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, big forest land are used for actually palm oil cultivation, which is again going to the biofuel production. Okay. So, we'll find that predominantly there are three different types of land use, agricultural land, wasteland and then forest land and if you go into the detail all three actually work in a different ways so for example to sustain agricultural activity when we come back again to the question of sustainability of all these three energy systems model as professor junet talks about issues of governance structures and transactions you will find it require a very different approach but predominantly you will find that in case of uh, asian context african context uh, we use the template of Western model in terms of, let's say, distribution, in terms of financing, but we also want to balance out in terms of livelihood options, local level decentralized governance, and then providing access to energy, which is linked with, again, let's say, when we are talking about livelihood option micro enterprises. And that's where I think the challenge exists at the broad level, which comes from, let's say, even governance point of view, or let's say, from the point of view of financing or let's say community mobilization. So these challenges automatically comes into the picture and the contrast between what state wants and what community wants. So broadly, these are the challenges from the biofuel point of view, I see. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor uh, Mishras. Seems like when there are though we, there are very diverse views on sustainable energy systems uh, or futures, uh, but still there are some common threads that I can see. For example, access is one of the issue. Affordability is one of the issue, particularly for developing countries. 
So, uh, Professor James is uh, uh, from a developed country. I would like to invite him to, uh, to uh, reflect on these views uh, in, in, uh, based on his perspective from the European Union or beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, tonight, <coughs> And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It is an honor, and I've never been to Pakistan, actually. I had been working in Central Asia earlier, but um, it is uh, a really full of new impulses, and I'm very excited about the, this opportunity. Um, sustainability, um, your question was, what, what is the idea of sustainability in, the, in this context of the energy transition? And I would like to briefly uh, refer to the graph that you showed at the beginning, to the, what, what you call new uh, energy system of, of the future, and uh, stress that there are four main uh, characteristics that are really new that, that mark this system change. One is, of course, the complementarity of different renewable energy sources with each other. The problem is that we have to uh, cope volatility. So if it's only photovoltaics, you don't have it in the night. If it's only wind, there's no wind and so on and so forth. So you need to cope with the complementarity and this of course needs to be incentivized appropriately. Uh, the, second is, the second characteristic is flexibility measures. We see them uh, across the board, be it storage, be it demand uh, response, demand flexibility, and all these flexibility measures usually also to some extent affect behavior of consumers and not of the producers. So that's again a paradigm change which we didn't see in the fossil energy world. The third one is uh, closely connected to this and that is the bidirectionality of the energy flows. So it is not only from the producer to the consumer but the consumer who becomes a prosumer actually may at the same time also feed electricity into the grid which, especially for the utilities and the DSOs, poses great um, uh, challenges. And last <coughs> but not least, this of course is all embedded in digitization. So uh, it is important to control these energy flows in real time or more or less in real time. And again, it is not only a centralized process, but again, it is decentralized and consumers have to be involved and have to, as we've learned in the keynote uh, message, uh, the keynote speech this morning, um, they have to be learning of how to deal with these new energy systems. And of course, um, measuring uh, is, is key uh, here, so to understand how much energy do I actually really uh, use uh, in order to become more energy efficient. And that is where, our, where I want to give my understanding of uh, sustainability here. It is not so much about, uh, or it is not only about the deployment of renewables, more capacity, but the best kilowatt hour is of course the one not used, not consumed. So the better we become in energy efficiency, the more effectively we can exploit renewables and the more independent countries like Pakistan, India and Bangladesh can become from, uh, from imports. And that of course um, uh, is, a, is a huge challenge because it's not just a matter of circularity as an economic concept, but uh, I would argue we have to achieve a circular society. So it is much broader than this. It is a socio-economic context that will require from individuals to change their behavior and to learn how to um, run these new systems. And with that, I'll give the floor back to Junaid. Thank you. Very much, uh, Professor Jens. I think you have brought in a very important perspective that means traditionally when we see uh, 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 any model of mean energy systems that we have seen uh, more recently, I mean at least during the last hundred years, we see I mean a very uh, uh, one-way relationship between uh, utility and consumers. But you have brought in a very interesting perspective where I see energy systems, uh, energy consumers as the main actor uh, or maybe mean uh, the potential is huge but if i think mean in terms of governance this may create uh, 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 governance even more challenging so mean with this uh, uh, i would again mean uh, uh, go back to mudassar uh, to, to talk little more bit about uh, the overall governance of the system what are the governance challenges that we face uh, when we, we talk about energy sustainability in developing countries in general and uh, uh, Pakistan in particular and then 
how you see these ideas of new actors popping up every day new energy sources popping up every day what are their implications for governance over to you yeah thanks for that question absolutely you know i think you know as our colleague just mentioned you know it's and i tried to mention in my earlier uh, talk that you know it is has to be taken holistic and as um, uh, ma'am here also mentioned that see just last year so you have to look sustainability with affordability so just last year if our energy import bill is 17 billion dollars out of which in the power sector 70% if our power uh, is produced through imported fuels right and coupled with the fact that today our power demand is 25000 megawatts in peak load with a capacity installed at 40000 so if you just take that in totality it makes things affordable uh, unaffordable um, you know this has caused you know uh, economic downturn and foreign exchange crisis balance of payments crisis and of course the dollar crisis so that's the fine balance which i was trying to uh, um, get to now i think as far as your current question is concerned the governance issue see uh, i think uh, our, our colleague online also mentioned this the policy the policies are paramount and their deployment and governance are paramount. So we work in a highly regulated market if you look at the power utility. The problem here is that we make policies which are normally and you know over the years have been nice, have been good, but their implementation has been lackluster and completely you know not there to be honest. So I think consistency policy framework is the rule number one. For example, we have had a, a renewable energy policy in 2019. Nothing was deployed under it. Sporadic, ad hoc uh, planning was done, um, and no systematic and integrated approach was taken. So, in terms of governance, um, you know, all the stakeholders in the market in the sector have to be taken together, and the plan has to be integrated. Today, finally, after all this, you know, uh, how should you say, bloodbath in terms of our eco economy, finally, you know, the government and, um, uh, and the regulator are trying to go towards an integrated approach, but we are still stuck with those imported fuel, we are st still stuck with that idle capacity, something needs to be done with it. What was done in, you know, other countries and developing countries and, you know, like India and Turkey and other places, you know, they were taken, uh, you know, the laws were enacted and they were implemented, uh, like electricity market laws. Competition was created, the markets were created, and the systems and technology was created to implement those uh, markets. Nothing happened overnight. We have started a little late, but again, uh, I still see there's some, some inconsistency in those policies and the implementation. For example, our national electricity policy calls for indigenization, 30% uh, indigenization up till by uh, 2030. Again, you know, as uh, Afia mentioned, you know, this would include local coal. So where's the balance that you would need? The only two indigenous resources we have are renewable, including hydro and local coal. Gas is not there anymore, which is the cheapest source of power generation. So do we implement it or not? As a developing country, India has, I think, already, <laughs> uh, you know, finished their coal reserves. We are just starting on it. Um, they did it at the right time. We did not. But we need it. Um, so again, the governance in terms of a strong regulator who makes those reg uh, regulations and is consistent with those regulatory frameworks is paramount. Another example for, uh, you know, we have tried to, you know, uh, embark upon an ambitious renewable program, which is 30% in our mix also, fleet also, by 2030. And we're not just doing it because the government said so. We're doing it in a, we're trying to do it in a systematic and scientific way. We, are, we have the, you know, consultants for it. We're trying to enact the technology for it and trying to understand how this intermittency is going to respond with the rest remaining fleet of ours. Um, <clears throat> We also have to be cognizant of the fact that we don't, we don't want stranded capacity. We don't want capacity that is there and is stranded because the previous policy, under the previous policies, it was built in the first place. So we have to make things right along with planning perfectly for the future. Um, so strong governance uh, in terms of uh, the regulator consistent policies. Um, uh, we have about 700 megawatts of, our, of, of competitive auction based RFPs with the regulator for the last two and a half years. Um, we still don't have approvals for it. Who bears the cost of that indecision or those lack of approvals? Because they were not approved, an expensive sources of energy was produced. You know, so there's a cost attached to it. So 
decision making and uh, strong regulatory frameworks are important. And I would say in terms of government, integrated planning and approach, transmission, distribution and generation go hand in hand. You cannot put up generation without a very clear and co comprehensive way to distribute it. So that integration is important and of course whatever policies we're making at the top level have to be decentralized and accepted by the provinces. There's this is not a political issue anymore, it's a national issue uh, because I think it's the hottest issue now, uh, the power sector in Pakistan and uh, the energy sector in Pakistan and the, and, and the dependence on foreign f uh, resources. So that is, I think, the way these approaches can be taken. It's a difficult way f uh, road ahead, but it has to be um, crossed. Uh, mostly I will agree with Umabuddha sir what uh, he said. I will add a little more. Rightly so, we have announced so many policies, but none of the policy we have announced so far uh, was comprehensive enough. Each policy was announced to cater to the needs of one or the other interest group. And the policy was successful in its objective. Each policy was announced to cater to the in So uh, basically, in the state in which we are today is because of those policies which were not um, which were announced without any long term vision and uh, without uh, um, integrated energy planning so <clears throat> that's the first point secondly uh, our decision making is centralized <coughs> and it is not by the professionals without the involvement of professionals in the decision making process how can we improve the governance of the sector? And again, I agree that we need an integrated plan and we, have, we cannot focus only on generation with, and uh, uh, at the same time while ignoring the gen, uh, distribution side and the transmission side. We need an integrated plan. And we also need a complex mix of generation in which large and small size uh, different uh, types of projects are included of different renewable sources. And we have to move away from the fossil fuels. But now coming back to the uh, point, uh, what are the challenges faced by the developing countries, in particularly Pakistan? In Pakistan, we are in a capacity trap. We have signed long-term agreements with so many uh, uh, power plants for 30, for 30 years or so. And these are the agreements. In the presence of these agreements, it is not possible to move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. So unless we renegotiate those contracts, there is no way forward. Otherwise, we have to cope with these uh, capacity which is already in the system. We are, uh, as of today, we have excess capacity, but at the same time, our per capita energy consumption is one of the lowest in the world. And at the same time, almost 150 million uh, population is with the <coughs> unmet or undermet energy demand. So the whole uh, governance system needs to be changed, needs to be revamped, and it has to be decentralized, not at the provincial level, but at the company level. Let the companies decide how, they, uh, how, to, how to manage the system. And obviously, we need a very effective regulatory framework, and for this, we need an independent regulator. As of today, government is mainly regulating the whole sector. And by government regulating the sector, it is not possible to move forward. Uh, you brought some uh, even more complexity to the system because, I mean, now when we talk about governance of energy systems, of course, we have to talk about these competing uh, uh, cr crops and then competition with other sectors also. So, how you would frame? Uh, uh, governance issue in, in the context of developing, energy governance issue in the context of developing countries. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, continuing with what I have talked about biofuels, I will give a practical example in terms of, let's say when we are talking about renewable options at the local level. So, uh, and from the community side, what are the challenges that is faced, potential challenges. So, uh, one has to understand that when we are talking about energy use, whether it is for individual use, for example, bulb for a lightning, or it is for public use like street lights, or it is for, let's say, when we are talking about common use for irrigation purpose, or let's say, uh, for example, you are a 
developing a cluster based micro enterprises so it is in a collective activity so understanding those nuances become much more important to design governance so for example when it comes to individual uses uh, you require a very different types of let's say support systems of cities to individuals but the same system will not work let's say when we are talking about creating a common irrigation system or providing a common energy systems to a cluster based activity for example hand loom based activity metal working activities so that's where i think in, in india uh, government actually learned through trial and error so initial phases where most of the policies were designed for individual subsidies individual support system which worked to a certain extent but over a period of time it was found that when it comes to renewable uh, one has to understand the context so for example in a cluster where hand loom activity is going on and solar photovoltaic spv support is given so there actually joint jointness become much more important where 10 persons are coming they have a common interest they will definitely act as a one unit so in that way i think the challenge exists when it comes to actual implementations from the sides of communities so whether policies are actually adaptable to these kind of nuances and specifically when administration has to implement because as the main topic so linearity is much more easy for the state to actually implement and market to provide financial support but challenging the linearity requires these type of practical issues which most of the time state actually find it difficult to do because then in that case we have to have 10 different ways of solving the issues so i think that is a practical part of challenge that we face when it comes to renewable issues in developing countries i think mean professor uh, uh, jains uh, can you uh, see that mean how we can reconcile all these ideas uh, in <laughs> i wish I, i i knew how to reconcile them but um, at least we we can try uh, so uh, i would like to um, highlight another challenge that is um, uh, that is connected to all what we've heard to these different levels be it uh, at the level of the energy utility be it at the government level um or be it at the individual level and that is uh, what i would uh, call the heterogeneity challenge so what is what is really new in this um in this in in this context of new energy systems of renewable energy systems is that we have so many diverse actors which previously were totally alien to the system so we are expecting that an energy utility cooperates with municipalities with smes local smes micro enterprises and with uh, the hundreds of thousands of millions of individual consumers now um in terms of governance this brings uh, the governance problem to a micro level to a small level and that is to the level of the concrete renewable energy project because those typically are decentral and much smaller than the large centralized fossil energy projects and in such decentralized smaller projects um complementarity is 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 trump so th that's what what you really want you want to have let's say a municipality with a large uh, rooftop because they have a public school where you can deploy a lot of photovoltaics you want smes that have a very a lot of elasticity in their energy consumption in order to match production with consumption so let's say a brewery or heating or cooling is great because they can almost at any given time self consume the the um, the electricity produced and don't need to bring it back into the grid which creates problems for the stability of the grid and which is of course also difficult to manage <clears throat> and then of course you have the uh, individual consumers who are the ones who also have to be taken on board because they have to learn how to live with these new energy systems and that's where actually co-ownership um it becomes a, a, a very important um pivotal uh, element of this energy transition that is in 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 three aspects <clears throat> first as a learning device and that again uh, refers back to what we learned in the in the keynote so um even if it is for an sme or an, a micro enterprise which supposedly is more uh, willing to become energy efficient they still need to understand and if you own it uh, i mean there's this famous quote nobody has ever seen somebody washing a rental car and that's the same thing in energy so if you are start to become a co-owner you will start to understand how the system works how you can run it more efficient and how you integrate it into the system the second 
aspect of this um, uh, 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 of this uh, function of co-ownership is of course motivational so if you become a prosumer even as a small scale then you will have an incentive to self-consume the electricity and you will have an uh, incentive to become more energy efficient because the less you self-consume the more you can share with your peers with the neighbors or with other members of let's say an energy community so there's a strong economic incentive also to reduce consumption. But that is different if you can only self-consume. So you need to have this choice to either self-consume or sell to others, to your peers, in electricity sharing context, for example. And the third one um, is uh, as important as the other two, and that is acceptance. We also need acceptance by the population, by the consumers of all this new infrastructure, be it extension of the grid, be it storage, be it the deployment of wind turbines or, or photovoltaics, there's a lot of resistance in the European Union against wind power. Obviously, that may be very de much depending on context, and the context in these countries here is, is different. However, acceptance is still important because it is um, a facilitator. And coming back to, and that's where I'll close, coming back to um, what I said initially, this heterogeneity challenge uh, renders this uh, th this much, uh, these processes much more complex because a municipality does not usually enter into um, uh, under a business model into a cooperation with let's say um, uh, the micro enterprises or the individual uh, customers or the consumers for individual consumers uh, for a long time the co-op model cooperatives um, were, was, was the model to, to go however if you think of a small and medium sized enterprise that buys into a cooperative, and let's say, because they have more uh, financial stamina, they own 10 or 20% of the equity, then of course they want voting rights proportional to their equity. And in cooperatives, very often it's one member, one mo vote. That's the general principle. Of course, there are deviations. But such a business model may not be attractive for the SME. And the same is true for the municipality. Municipalities very often shy away when they only have minority shares in projects. They are used to either own it all or at least own 51%. So all these different actors now need to embark on this energy transition under one common roof. And that is where, where heterogeneity is, is so different from what we know because we need business models, and that's again governance, that actually reflect this. And that is what, what we've been doing for the last um, seven years, in, 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 amongst others, in a Horizon 2020 project SCORE, supporting consumer ownership in renewables. We've um, designed and implemented a new uh, business model, the so-called Consumer Stock Ownership Plan, CSOP, which is, um, was invented in the 1950s, actually, in the United States, uh, many, many uh, years ago, in a totally different context in, the, in agriculture. But we have brought this into the energy uh, world and uh, we see that this is a business model that modernizes the co-op uh, model because it's flexible and it, it offers voting rights proportional to shareholding and it opens uh, actually such projects up for cooperation of very different heterogeneous partners. Thank you very much, Professor Jens. Seems like this is a very promising model, but I think when we see <coughs> our uh, local systems, then in most of the time, poverty is a major concern. So, thinking of a consumer to become an investor in these kind of models is mean, uh, something that I think need a serious consideration. We'll be coming back to uh, these ideas. But I, I would now uh, uh, mean uh, 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 like to uh, our panelists to discuss that mean we have so many ideas that we now it is not a conventional model now it is not about conventional fuels and now it is also not about conventional business models or I mean even uh, uh, actors so if we I mean see this current in, uh, energy scenario and changing landscape what are some of the uh, most pressing policy mayors that that can improve because I mean what is happening so, for example, Pakistan is currently in this CTBTM mode. I mean, they, they are I mean, trying to revise this in entire energy market. Uh, so, what directions these are taking and what further we need to do? So, I will start with again, uh, uh, Mudassar Saab, please. Yeah, um, 
So, you know, as I was trying to, uh, the point that I was alluding to earlier and which my colleague Afia also mentioned was that uh, the decentralization still has not taken place in, in Pakistan right now. And you know what did, um, uh, uh, our doc uh, doctor just mentioned right now, uh, see, in Pakistan, there was unbundling in the 90s. And it ultimately wanted to lead to, you know, a competitive landscape with privatized distribution companies. Except all the good things were set to happen. Again, the point that I was trying to make that inconsistent and unfinished policies. The policy was there. It even in, was enacted, but it just got left in the middle. So without taking too much time on that point, so then KE ultimately was priv privatized, my company, in 2005. And in 2005, it was privatized to provide, you know, in, a massively improved quality of service, engage with the communities, the, all the things that you mentioned right now, have that co-op kind of a model, improve its bottom line, of course, and, you know, stop the, you know, money drain that was going from subsidies by the government into it. The other distribution companies were supposed to follow suit um, in the late 90s and even, you know, till to this day, the, in my view, the government is not supposed to be in the business of distributing power bills and collecting power bills, you know, <laughs> that, that's not the business they should be into. But they are, unfortunately, except for KE. So now that KE, for example, is a privatized utility, uh, that decentralization hasn't occurred, though. We plan, we fight, we try to implement, we fight. With the regulator, with the government, there's heavy, heavy regulation even on the private utility. So that decentralization hasn't fully happened even in the private utility. Yet, you know, we've invested the resources and tried to improve as best as they can. But if this happened in the entire country the way it was supposed to, you know, we would probably be seeing a very different power sector today. Um, and as far as, you know, the point on prosumers that you're mentioning, you know, again, only a private utility can be enterprising in that way and can have that, those ideas and that bandwidth to engage with, you know, their consumers and have the whole municipal concept. So we have deployed 300 megawatts of behind the meter uh, solar uh, and, you know, engaged 10,000 people for them. We deploy, we work with the Kuwait Foundation and microfinancing facilities to give cheap financing to SMEs to deploy behind the meter uh, uh, solar, um, etc. So we are trying to do that community engagement in terms of both uh, co-ownership, not financial, but at least in terms of uh, facilitation and, uh, and, you know, being enterprising in that. So again, uh, uh, long story short is that, you know, it, had, it has to be done across the board. It can't just be secluded to, this is not a pilot project, you know, this is a very important industry in Pakistan's economic context. So, so that is one thing. Uh, secondly, um, uh, on your point towards, um, you know, what can be on the CTBCM, again, I hope, <laughs> you know, this is implemented in the right way because, you know, it could be something that is disastrous and it could be something that completely changes our landscape in a positive way if the governance is not correct, if collusions don't happen, if the right uh, governance and checks and measures are put in place. So CTBCM, you know, is, again, it's what India is doing. You know, they've got mature and robust energy markets now, uh, comp competitive markets now. It's not just on the industry level. It's, you know, on the entire kind of value chain. Turkey did it again. I keep referring back to the Brazil, Philippines. You know, we've studied them. We've looked at these markets. These are all peer countries, which I would say, who have actually gone through this. We are now initiating. So competitive markets, it has to be done in a very phase-wise uh, manner. Um, the right uh, checks and technologies need to be deployed uh, because, you know, if everyone just puts up solar plant and has, you know, small contracts with an industry, again, the grid is going to be affected and the right infrastructure has to go along with it. So um, uh, the CTBC, a model, as I mentioned earlier, models and policies we make are very nice, uh, but the implementations are poor. So the CTBC, a model is good, but in my view, you know, we've copy-pasted a lot of things that have happened in much better countries, uh, much more developed countries, which won't really work here. So those things and tweaks, you know, we keep engaging with the stakeholders to kind of fine-tune these models. So those things, you know, that, that stakeholder engagement amongst the decision-makers is very crucial, private and public sector, so, we, so that, you know, the right 
uh, decisions are made. And uh, you know, I keep coming back to the point that you know the, the regulation, the regulator needs to be strong. You mentioned you know decentralization. Even on the prosumer part, there's regulation. Even on the microgrids, there's regulation. So that should be deregulated and left to the utility to be enterprising enough to uh, set its own future and course. Mafia, briefly, we are not left with much time, but I mean, what are your opinions about… Yes, we need market, but uh, with uh, due respect, uh, not the type of the market which the, uh, the market model, the CTBCM is. Currently, we have only 18 percent of the cap uh, capacity which is uh, which can be which can be traded in the market. So, with 18 percent of the capacity, the CTBCM cannot be implemented. We need a market, but before that, uh, we need uh, the whole set of uh, reforms uh, in the power sector. And now, uh, yes, we need a very comprehensive energy policy and a legal framework, which take into account not only the fossil fuels, but all the, these pro-consumer, uh, uh, all the renewable type, uh, related um, matters, these should be taken care of. Uh, and this must, we must have a legal framework for all, this thi all these things. And yes, we need an independent and effective regulatory framework, uh, independent from the influence of the government, Privatize, yes, pri we need private sector involvement. There are uh, no uh, two opinions about it, but there is a way to go. First, we, we have to commercialize, then move, eventually move towards privatization. Otherwise, uh, there is, um, the system uh, will not. Professor Satya, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, what would you mean uh, suggest as a one or two pressing policy measures that are needed for reconciling the kind of ideas, the contradictions, and mean even conflicts uh, with with other sectors and within energy sector itself that that developing countries need to think about in in general, based on maybe your study of fossil fuels in many uh, developed con uh, many countries around the world. Uh, so, uh, on the optimistic note, and then I will share an analogy, okay, so to take home the point. So, for example, when we talk about team game, for example, football, so most ideal player will be goalkeeper. So, somebody will think that he is actually a useless person and striker takes all the credit. So, I think, uh, but actually, if a goalkeeper does not does his work, team is lost. So, in the same way, I think if we are seeing the renewable energy issues, if we see as in a team game, you will find that each actor have a specific role to play. And one has to appreciate that one actor cannot dictate others. So, we have to appreciate each other's strengths and weaknesses. So, in that context, uh, what community can provide, what state can provide and what, let's say, when we are talking about market can provide. And based upon each renewable energy actually context, the game may change, rules may change. Okay. So, one has to be appreciative of that. So, in that context, I think, for example, you shared that uh, in poor areas, it will be very difficult. I have a very different take. For example, even in case of renewable energy, where actually communities are engaged in day-to-day -day operations. So, one has to understand that renewable energy systems where even poor are involved, their day-to-day -day operations become much more efficient as compared to other. But they are not good at, let's say, actually managing technology, new technology that comes, or let's say the capital cost that is required a very important part of maintenance issue that comes into the picture. So, if you burden everything on the community, it's a failed approach. But they are very good at day-to-day -day operations. So, if we appreciate that and design systems accordingly, I think it will be much more win-win game for everybody. So, I think in policy, these issues has to come into picture. That is my understanding. Yeah, over to you, Professor. Incentive system. 
which should include uh, bits for small um, generation units. Um, it should include rules for electricity sharing. Is it on now? Ah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so. Uh, we, we need an uh, appropriate incentive system that comprises of, um, for example, fits for micro installations, for small installations. We need uh, rules for electricity sharing in order to enable peer-to-peer -peer trading within energy communities or within neighborhoods. Very important. And, of course, access to finance is a problem, especially for small-scale pro uh, projects. So, uh, but all these three, um, uh, and, and that's where I want to link my, my final remarks to what the two of you have said, and, and Satya actually. Um, so yes, we need governance, but it, we shouldn't over-regulate, because we should also leave some room for the private actors to try out uh, what works best. So regulatory sandboxes could be an, an, an example, uh, a way forward. And we need basic rules, especially with regard to individuals. And that's where I refer to Satya and to India, which in uh, uh, December 2020, if I recall correctly, um, passed so-called consumer rules for electricity, which uh, in, um, included the right for presumership for individuals. So that's, that's, that's really important. So you need these basic rules, uh, but you shouldn't at the same time over-regulate and you should try to learn from, from other peers that are similar to, to, these, uh, to, to Pakistan or India to see what their experiences are because as I, um, as I mentioned earlier the European Union may not be the, the, the best and, and you know we, we maybe learn from their failures because many things didn't work out the way that they, that they should have and with that I think um, uh, my, my last remark would be uh, that this however should include the development of business models and the, the support for these business models by technical assistance um, coaching, uh, access to finance um, by pilot projects, because all uh, of, of what we've been discussing here needs to be tangible, um, so that a pilot project can actually be followed up with uh, to see that it is actually doable and that it does not remain something totally abstract. And that's um, where certainly I would like to entice you to look into our experiences with the CSOP implementation that we've uh, implemented CSOPs not only in the European Union but also we're doing this also in other countries like in Colombia uh, hopefully um, so uh, yeah render render these projects uh, tangible and um, uh, provide uh, the, the basic rules and not over regulate that, that's I think my, my conclusion thank you very much professor Jens I think the discussion is very exciting, particularly when I think about some of the models that Aga Khan Rural Support Program has been doing in uh, northern areas of Pakistan, these uh, Shandur Utility Company and Yadgar Utility Company. So this is very exciting. But in the favor of time, now we are left with only 12 minutes. I think I should open the floor for questions. Uh, seems like there are so many uh, uh, hands raised. So on the first row, please. Please briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question. Uh, well, uh, thank you all the panelists for talking much about energy in futures. My name is uh, Dr. Inayatullah Jan and I am director of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Agriculture, Peshawar. Uh, this has been a very fruitful discussion on the energy sustainability and the future prospects. But uh, I felt that the whole discussion uh, about energy futures and energy sustainability has been uh, revolving around the supply side, the market side, and the policy side, which is obviously one of the, uh, side of the sides of the pictures. Uh, we can talk about sustainability and affordability if we have uh, access to multiple fuels. I have written a, a paper on multiple fuels, multiple choices notion, and if that is the case, then it's uh, quite meaningful to talk about sustainability, affordability, and uh, better energy future. But there is another side of the picture, and that is the consumer side. And particularly in the developing countries, Pakistan, India, and all the developing countries where majority of the population, they do not have access to even the basic energy needs, what we define as the energy poverty. And uh, you all know that energy is now not a need, it is a human, basic human right of all population. They should have access to clean, affordable and sustainable energy. So uh, my concern is if we are in a situation where majority of the populations, they do not have access 
to the basic energy needs, then what does sustainability uh, notion mean here? Like uh, I just give you an example of my one of my projects in the northern areas of Pakistan, and that was about uh, biomass fuels. And my findings were that people are ruthlessly uh, cutting the forest for their fuels. And while presenting in a conference in Sakar IBA, uh, one of the uh, participants from Lahore, he asked me that I don't believe that people do not have access to energy. I told him that you don't believe because you are belonging to the metropolitan Lahore. You just go to the rural areas and see people, literally they do not have access to the basic energy needs. And I have seen it personally. And most of you who have been to the rural areas, they would have seen. Then I said that they, uh, cut forest because they uh, need it. He was not believing. He said, why do they do it? I said, they do it because they, they need to cook for their family. They need to warm their houses. They need to warm their water for, for washing and other purposes. So what I mean to say is this is a ground reality, that people do not have access to the basic energy okay. needs. And if that is the case, then how can we uh, I mean, reflect the sustainability dimension from the consumer's point of view, where people do not have uh, access to energy? Professor Satendra, would you uh, uh, like to answer this question? Because it is about rural areas where people still uh, rely on biofuels. What, what sustainability means to them? Uh, I think uh, at least from Indian point of view, I can share example and then it will make sense to what professor has also shared. So, uh, and one has to appreciate that uh, sustainability is not a single point bullet that one has defined and everywhere it will be actually implemented. For example, what he has talked about, let's say when we are talking about basic electricity, for example, in Indian context in hilly areas, when it comes, you will find that electricity that is required for let's say lighting purpose which is state provides uh, in terms of let's say primary energy consumption is very less so state provides but major consumption is in terms of let's say heating purpose because it's a cold area you require heat so that is not at all possible because one phase light is there you cannot use heater okay so that becomes a problem you will get a fault you will not get electricity for 10 days 12 days so definitely they have to rely on nearby forest areas common forest areas that exist biomass so I think, uh, so in that context, uh, as a policy maker, we have to be actually careful in terms of redefining that. Can we provide efficient stores in that context, so rather than only focusing on electricity, which is provided by the grids. So I think in that way, we have to address the issue. So it has to be multifaceted rather than only energy, which is used for electricity or let's say automobile only. Okay, so I thank you, thank you, Professor Satinda. The third row, Mike Paskering. I'm a faculty student of law, sir. Uh, my first question is from Dr. Uh, Mudassir, Mr. Mudassir. Sir, you have mentioned the competition, competition in the market. Do you consider that the biggest concern of the citizen of Karachi is the K-Electricity bill? Because KE does not pave the way for competition in the market. Secondly, from the panel, sir, uh, <clears throat> especially considering the situation of our countries like Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, so we suffer from political crisis, economical conditions are very severe, and the social, uh, there is social aids disorder, and many, uh, Dr. Nath has mentioned the energy access, I am mentioning the uh, basic human rights, the education. Many of us in the rural areas lack from the uh, clean water, education, and all such things. Is, don't you think, isn't it a light to talk about the sustainable energy, and uh, uh, is it, isn't it a light to achieve when all these are... Uh, Lacking for the basic human rights. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. I think <clears throat> your question was, uh, uh, I think your question was that KE is not allowing competition. Was that the question? Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, it wasn't just K. So, all the distribution companies in Pakistan, you know, through the regulator had an exclusive distribution license for their uh, respective tra um, service areas, right? Um, not just KE, all of them. So, this was obviously by design and this is something that, you know, was there in the licenses of them all. K Electric has recently, if you know, if you look up at the NEPRA website also and read up on it, just filed a non-exclusive distribution license by itself. So uh, we have not 
gone to seek for another exclusive period. Uh, we have gone for a non-exclusive license, which automatically, obviously, you know, alludes to the fact that, you know, we are open to competition, we are open to new entrants, and, uh, you know, we welcome it. Uh, so, you know, CTBCM was spoken about. Uh, we don't agree with many aspects of the model, but we do agree to the fact that, you know, if there has to be competition, so be it. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll only kind of help us further improve the company through that competition. And, uh, of course, the regulator also itself has enacted the model. Um, so, again, my answer to your question is that, yes, till date, the license was exclusive. Now, since the license ex expired, KE has not back, went um, back, gone back for an exclusive license. It actually applied for a non-exclusive license. So, that was the only question for me, right? Thank you. Thank you. I think in the test of time, we'll just take two more questions. Zishan, the second row, and... No, please, mean we have limited time. When most of the people in rural areas are already suffering, uh, are already not having the access to basic human rights, like I've mentioned, the clean water, the education, the health services, if you go to the rural areas, especially of Sindh. Yeah, I think provinces. I understand your question. There is an extensive literature which even now talks about energy as a right itself, basic human rights, because I mean it is then connected with so many, uh, uh, even quality education and stuff like that. So I think that uh, literature is addressing that I mean, already. Uh, Zishan? Thank uh, you, sir. My yes. question is in a broader perspective. Earlier in her keynote speech, uh, uh, Francisca said that transition to green energy is only a solution for Pakistan because we have a very high energy intensity in the country, right? And Dr. Uh, Afias said that we cannot do that because we have IPPs and we have long-term contracts with them like for 30 years. Uh, I think uh, I have one question from each of the panelists in, a, in an order, maybe. Uh, like Mudassir uh, Saab, maybe tell us what is the cost if we uh, get want to get rid of the IPP contracts. Like in that scenario, what is the expected cost because you are dealing with the, with the IPPs? And Jens, because you are expert in legal matters, and can you discuss what would be the legal advice on the matter in the international laws? Because we, we, are, we don't have much experts in that, in that matters. And finally, Afia, what would be the most essential reform that you want to suggest for, for a better energy system. Thank you. <coughs> Let's go, take question from Sajad as well and then we uh, try to answer collectively. Because we have just left with five more minutes. I don't want to be a barrier between uh, lunch and you. Um, thank you very much. I'm Sajad. I will have a brief question uh, to Mr. Mudassir when you talk about the local uh, uh, it's about local consumers of K Electric. You just talked about improving the system. I want to take you. I want to take you to what since Commerce Minister just said yesterday at Karachi Chamber of Commerce that uh, people of Karachi are paying three to five rupee per unit more because of the uh, fuel adjustment charges uh, to K Electric because of the obsolete power generation plants. So how do you see and what improvement do you see in this scenario? Thank you. You know, this is, this is some of the pitfalls of being a monopoly, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, I'll answer Sajjad's question first. Uh, absolutely, you know, see, uh, there's always room for improvement. So let me take you quickly the journey, right? Uh, unending load shed, uh, uh, 20 billion per month uh, subsidies, 40% TND losses. Today, um, 4,000 megawatts deployed capacity, 15% uh, TND losses, 70% load shed free, including despite the fact that 50% is undocumented, kachi abadis, gangsters rule that place. Um, so, so, so do understand where the company was and where it is. A lot of our, our we had commitments from the government when the uh, company was privatized, including gas supply. That was the government's commitment. We set up gas plants, uh, efficient, highly efficient gas plants. We don't get indigenous gas anymore, zero. We have to use RLNG. So because we have 70%, 80% of our fleet on gas, which is now based on imported RLNG, yes, our generation basket is high. The rest of the Pakistan gets the benefit of hydropower. 
we have no access to direct hydropower. So that is one major component which we don't have access to. Uh, and we are very actively working on getting direct access to hydropower right now. So we're working with northern agencies, including PDO, AJK, PDO, etc., to get us that direct access to hydropower, which will benefit all of us, inshallah. Uh, yes, uh, you know, we have to improve uh, further uh, as a generation company and as a distribution company. So please go through the recently uh, um, uh, submitted power acquisition program we have submitted to NEPRA, uh, which is, uh, goes hand in hand with a 400 billion rupee investment plan, which is approximately 2.5 billion dollars, uh, which is uh, three, uh, which has three basically, you know, uh, objectives. Reduction in cost of generation, reduction in uh, uh, TND losses, increase in consumers, growth in consumers, and ultimately benefiting the citizens uh, in our license area. Uh, sorry, and your question uh, was? Um, How to get rid of IPPs? See, the issue is, uh, look, uh, again, I'll quickly, uh, going back to the policy, and Afia, ma'am, ma can also answer this. You know, the, the a policy, it's, we're stuck with policy. They got, ex uh, you know, indexation, dollar indexation on every component of the tariff in those IPPs, whether they produce or not. So today, you know, an IPP which was at 5 rupees, when it came up, was probably at 30 rupees because of dollar depreciation, right? And even if they're not producing due to expensive fuel, like you can't import it because of expensive fuel, they're still getting that 30 rupees. So that is the problem. So of course, if, you, if we take out, renegotiate those, so it, it's only, I mean, uh, you know, uh, if the take or pay element is taken out of it, and especially for those IPPs where the debts have been, have been paid off, and you know, the fixed costs are... I think I mean both answers are at least par uh, questions are partially answered. So I I would yeah. You want to say something? Sishan uh, asked what the policy measure is required: decentralization of power and keep politics away from the power sector. <laughs> this is the only suggestion uh, which I would suggest. And professional decision making. Very briefly, uh, uh, comment on your question on, uh, from a legal point of view, what could be solutions? One, of course, is with regard to inclusion and to energy justice, um, to tailor the incentives also to low-income households or energy poor. And an example for this is very often you have incentives which involve matching contributions, but if you don't have the first contribution, there's nothing to match. So that's often obviously a dead end with regard to low-income households, and it should be thought of how to, how to retailer these um, mechanisms. With regard to the business models, the, the uh, core piece of the CSOP, of the Consumer Stock Ownership Plan, is actually a fiduciary relationship. So individual uh, consumers, households, don't become shareholders in, let's say, the energy community directly, but they are represented by a fiduciary, um, which means that for the other partners, the community, the municipality or the SMEs, they have one interlocutor, a professional who knows about renewable energies with whom they interact and who represents the, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent that the 200 households own in the project. <coughs> the last, um, uh, and the la last uh, comment that I would like to make is that with regard to access to finance, uh, one should revert to what I call future earnings investments. So if you don't have savings, you have nothing to invest. If you don't have collateral, you uh, don't have access to capital credit. So the financing um, mechanisms involved should aim at um, future earnings to repay the investment actually. And that is again uh, what is associated with, the, with CSOP as a financing technique. Thank you. Yeah, it was not audible, Professor Junaid. Yeah. Any last word that you want to say before we 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 conclude this? Uh, I think uh, in the context of uh, renewable energy, the role of uh, regulators may become very important because, as we have discussed in the panel, also each will have their own interest. Market will like to maximize, state will like to control, community have their own problem. And in a democratic setup, we, we cannot set aside politics. So, and politics, when it is used for social good, definitely that is also required. So, I think 
role of regulators will become much more important. So, like in a game, role of referee becomes important for a good play. Regulators have to play that role in future. I think. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Satendra Nath Mishra. So, I think we have already exceeded our time by five minutes. Thank uh, all of our panelists uh, to come uh, from. Germany to Professor Satendra who spared his busy time for this discussion and Mudassar and Afia coming from Islamabad. Thank you very much for… Yeah, I mean I know uh, uh, KE, everybody knows this from Karachi. So thank you very much for your time and valuable insights and thank you for your insightful questions and patience and participating in this discussion. Sorry if I missed uh, anybody whom I could not give a chance to question. Thank you. Thank you.